Hello, and thanks for joining us. I'm Aaron Krebeck, Director of Library and User Services here at WRLC, and I'll be joined today by Tammy Hennick and Joel Shields, also from the Department of Library and User Services. We want to welcome you to our presentation about how we were able to add deaccessions as a service for the WRLC. We call this presentation Only Accessions in the Building, in part because Tammy and I both really enjoyed the show Only Murders in the Building, and its overall artistic style and also the way it portrayed certain characters. It's available on Hulu if you haven't seen it, and that's the end of my commercial for that show. Uh, but more importantly, the entire point of this project was to challenge the long-held idea that we could only do accessions in our building, and that deaccessions, removing material from the SCF, would be far too expensive and time-consuming time to do at any scale. We hope you enjoy it. When I first took over the role of Director of Library and User Services at WRLC, I inherited some deferred projects from my predecessor, Bruce Hulse. And one of those was a deaccessions project that we never had quite enough time to work out. As this project moved from Bruce's back burner to mine, I noticed that the topic of possible deaccessions kept coming up. Was there duplication in the shared collections facility? Was there extremely commonly held material that we just didn't need anymore? And if so, how could we get rid of it? Deaccessions had always been a tricky subject at WRLC. For most of our history, it was something that we could not and did not do except in rare and extreme circumstances. And the reason for that is partly illustrated in the following picture. In a Harvard high-density storage model like our SCF, items are shelved by height and depth rather than subject. That allows us to pack the maximum amount of material per cubic foot. One of the first things we do when we receive new material is to size it on a template. Books are given a two-character code that tells us the size. So for example, an AA book is like a mass market paperback. It's very shallow and short. While a DD book is like a bound journal volume, very tall and, and deep. But there's no metric to tell us the thickness. How many pages a book has doesn't really matter to us because the length of each cardboard tray is the same, and it's limited only by the available shelving in the SCF. On the screen, you see a tray full of DD books. But what makes deaccession tricky should be immediately apparent. If I need to deaccession the thick blue journal volume all the way on the left, I'm left with a rather large gap. I'd probably need to fill it with two or three other volumes of the DD size. But if I need to deaccession one of the orange volumes, I'm left with a much narrower hole, but still an empty space that I should probably use. So deaccession creates voids that must be filled to keep the high density storage. And it ends up being like a jigsaw puzzle. And this jigsaw takes time and therefore money. Because of our relationships with other consortia through groups like the Rosemont Shared Print Alliance and other professional organizations, I've gotten to know the managers of other Harvard high-density facilities. Knowing our own difficulties with deaccessions, I often ask these other managers whether they do deaccessions at scale, and the response is nearly always the same. <laughs> you can't do deaccessions in a Harvard high-density facility because of this whole void creation problem. But then they always follow up with, but my partner institutions sure would love it if I could. And there was something that sort of bugged me about this oft-repeated truism. Had anyone really tested it? How impossible would it really be? Because if everyone's partner institutions want it, shouldn't we confirm this impossibility? Ian Bogus is the executive director of RECAP, the country's largest off-site library shelving facility in Princeton, New Jersey. It's a Harvard high-density storage space. In working with Ian on other projects, I knew he was someone who liked using data rather than relying on assumptions. So I reached out to him, and we formed a small group of high-density storage managers to look at how deaccessions might be done effectively and efficiently 
despite the extra time and expense of filling those gaps. In networking with other managers across the United States and even Canada, we found that there were a few facilities that did manage to do weeding or deaccessions at a large scale. Some of them were able to accomplish this work because of unique advantages not available to most institutions, including WRLC. For example, some facilities had fancy robotic systems that could work round the clock and use laser optics to match books with open space. Others had access to vast reserves of student workers who could be employed in huge numbers for short periods of time and descend upon the stacks like, well, robots. But in talking to other institutions and brainstorming the more common elements of each, we were able to arrive at two different models that met certain requirements for removing and replacing material. The first requirement for any efficient deaccession is that the open gaps had to be filled at the time of removal. It had to be a one-out, one-in process. Because trying to keep track of which trays had holes and the size of those holes would be a time-consuming administrative nightmare on top of a process that we already knew was going to be fairly time-consuming. And since additional staff time will increase cost, it goes without saying that another important requirement is to keep cost down. At the very least, a major deaccession project should be less than the construction cost of building new space. It doesn't make any sense to spend $7 million to deaccession 1 million physical items if you could just build a new module for 5 or $6 million. Rather than billing partners for services by item, like WRLC, recap bills by units of work. Each service requires a certain number of work units. For example, shelving an item might cost two work units. Each work unit is tied to the staffing cost required to perform that work. Given the overall similarities in staffing costs between WRLC and RECAP, we were able to use RECAP's projected number of work units to design deaccessions modules, models that seemed like they would be affordable. The two deaccessions workflow options were simplified as books to trays on the left and trays to books on the right. In books to trays, new materials for accessions would be taken into the modules of the SCF and directly to the trays containing material for deaccession. From there, staff would remove the deaccession item and then look on their stack and replace it with one of the items of proper thickness that could squeeze into the void that was created from their stack of new accessions. This model was not suitable for WRLC, in part because it would require Wi-Fi signal throughout, throughout every aisle of the SCF, and it would require our SCF staff to catalog the tray location of new accessions while on the lift via a laptop. And this was very different than our existing workflows. One of our own internal requirements was that deaccessions couldn't deviate too far from our normal workflows for ease of, of use and for ease of implementing any new service. So instead, WRLC chose to design internal workflows for the trays to book model. SCF specialists would retrieve a large number of trays containing material to be deaccessioned. They'd bring those trays into the processing area and remove the deaccession de material. Then, new books from the same institution would be accessioned as normal and fit into the gaps created. The next step would be to do some small-scale testing and use our own workflows on a large project. Tammy will talk about that next part. Hello, and welcome to the Dakota. I mean, the Shared Collections Facility at WRLC. 
My name is Tammy Hennig, and I am the Shared Collections Supervisor here. As you can see, there are lots of books and boxes behind me. We have over 3 million items here. Wow. The discussion about deaccession has been ongoing for a long time now because of the cost involved and the complexity behind it. As the supervisor, I always get nervous about the thought of deaccessioning items. It's not because of the cost, no, but more because of how complicated it could get. Deaccessioning involves retrieving books from various places in the SCF, not just in one area. If it was one whole shelf, it would be simple, but it's not. Also, we have to consider the issue of a gap in the trays, because books have been checked out to the patrons. It may be a little tricky replacing the space with new books. Last fall, I did the pilot testing to see how long it would take for me to do the deaccessioning in the workflows we laid out, and also for Aaron and Tim, our Director of Finance and Administration, to develop a price point. We got a list from Arlington Campus Library of the books they wanted us to retrieve and send back to them. There were about 250 books. To replace those books, Fenwick Library sent us about 115 new books to replace the Arlington Campus Library books to fill in the gaps. Because both libraries are from George Mason, it was fine to mix the copies together in the trays. Using Alma Analytics, we put in the item barcode and ran the job to collect the tray locations. I will now explain the workflow that I did last fall. These boxes are from other libraries. Fenwick sent six boxes last fall with 115 new books. I unpacked and sorted them into different sizes using this template. Now that the books have been sorted, I will know which trays with deaccessioned books in them I will need to retrieve. For example, I have new B12 books, which means I will need to get the trays with B12 sized deaccessions. We're here in my office. As you can see, those trays, the ones with the labels, means the books were already processed. These are ones from the shared collections facility. And the ones with no labels, that means new books. I use Alma to get the total of items in each tray to make sure. For this tray, Alma says it has 21 books. So I already counted and it is 21 books. So perfect. All ready to deaccessionize. This is the list of items that I need to deaccessionize. I look at the tray location on the tray and look at the list to find the matching tray location. And according to this list, it says I need to remove two books from this tray, which are Win-Win and Negotiations. Those are the titles. Now, I need to update the item record for those two books, which means I need to remove the tray location, since they will be sent back to the library. I also add a code, which is WD, which means withdrawn. Joel will discuss this part later in the presentation and why it's important. 
then I need to fill out the online forms for inventory control. It would state that I have removed two books from this tray. Again, Joel will later explain more about this part. Using the master list of deaccessions in Excel that was sent to me from Arlington Campus Library, I highlighted the titles on the list of books that I have removed from the tray. This is to ensure that I have pulled the deaccessioned books. After this, I proceeded on to the next tray in the set. When I'm done with all of the trays, I fill in the gap with new books, but the important thing to do is to flip the books around so that, that way we would know which books to process because we wouldn't want to process all of the books in the, new, in the tray all over again, just the new incoming titles. So those two are filling the gaps. It's now full. We need to finish processing these two books, and then that's it. After I finish processing the new books, I fill out the forms online for inventory control. Now I need to pack the deaccessioned books and prepare them for shipment to Arlington Campus Library. All ready to be sent back to Arlington Campus Library. This small pilot project was successful enough that we then attempted a major deaccession of 5,440 items with these same workflows, and it was successful. And now we can offer it as a service because deaccessions are definitely possible and we are awesome. As Tammy said, we were able to take advantage of a George Mason request to repatriate over 5,000 items back to their campus as a way of developing our workflows but we needed to use the small pilot of 250 items to get an idea of how much a deaccessions project might cost. As Tammy was going through what we thought would be the best way to deaccession, she was timing herself and how long it took to do 10, 20, or more items in each step of the process. Now, as Tammy correctly asserted, she's pretty awesome, and under normal circumstances, our SCF supervisor would probably not be doing this work. So we needed to account for staff that probably weren't quite as fast or as awesome as Tammy, though still pretty great, and who also made a lower salary. In looking at the pilot, we guessed that we could recoup our labor costs by charging deaccessions at a rate of $1.70 per item. George Mason agreed to that pricing for the full project, and we would use the large test of 5,000 additional items to confirm that our pricing was accurate. Joel Shields will now explain how we tracked and confirmed time and cost to make sure this was a service that would work for everyone. Now that we have a workflow in place, we need to be able to track progress, costs, and staff efficiency. To do this, we've added additional functionality to the WLC SCF processing website. If you attended our presentation at last year's annual meeting, uh, you sh this should all look familiar to you. If you didn't, just know that this website was created to track the processing of all materials in and now out of the SCF. Upon logging into the website, you'll see a new card on the home page that shows information about tracking deaccessioning projects. Clicking on the Projects button, you'll, this will bring you into a list of our current projects. And as you can see, this page shows the project title, the date range of our project, the affiliated university, work progress, total hours worked on the project by WLC staff, and the estimated cost for the university based on a $1.70 per item cost metric. So on the project list page, if I click on that new project button that you saw up in the right hand corner, um, this will create a new project. And this includes the project name, the associated university type, uh, the start and projected end dates, the number of items to be processed for the project. Uh, when you um, click on the button to create the project, um, you'll see it is added back into the project list. And uh, with the project created, 
staff are now ready to begin working on a project. So we need to be able to log the hours that they work. Um, so a functionality has been built in for tracking time. And when you click on that tracking time button, it will uh, take you to a page that has a list of all the current projects. So all you would do is just click on the project you're going to be working on and then submit. And once you've done that, um, you're ready to begin deaccessioning. Uh, when you're working on a project, a badge will appear at the top of the screen to remind them of the hours that are being logged for the project that you're working on. At any time, clicking on the badge will take you back to the page um, where you were before so that you can log out with your hours. Uh, staff can track hours throughout the day as they work on a project. So for example, they may be working on a project for two hours in the morning and then they go to work on other duties. Uh, they can return to work on the project two more hours in that afternoon and the system will have recorded four hours instead of their full work day. So now that we're tracking the time that's being worked, it's time to begin deaccessioning some items. Uh, in the processing website, we will look up a record that needs to be deaccessioned and we'll click on the advanced settings button down on the bottom left. When we do that, it gives us several options. Uh, we can delete a record, which we do not want to do, but now there's added functionality for deaccessioning and then also for Alma deaccessioning. Clicking on the deaccession button will update the items barcode record with WD. Um, this is a suffix that we use to identify items uh, within the system and will be very important later on. The Alma deaccession button will utilize Alma's API to update the required fields in Alma with that same WD suffix, and all that happens with just a single click. So now if we do a search in our tracking website, we're able to see items that have been deaccessioned successfully, and they're using that same WD identifier. So now let's take a closer look at the projects list. Deaccession records are associated with the project based on the library and the begin and end dates. So for example, you can see here there are some items associated with the project for Gallaudet. These records are processed between February 14th and 28th. They're owned by Gallaudet University and have been given the suffix of WD. And um, on this page, it also gives us a progress bar uh, for the original target number uh, when the project was created, the estimated staffing costs on the number of hours worked, and the cost for the university based on um, an estimated $1.70 per item, and also an efficiency rating uh, to tell if we've assigned enough staff to a project, or in some cases, too many staff. From that list, if you click on the title of a project, it's going to show us some additional information about that project. Uh, the top provides similar information as the list on the uh, project list page. Uh, in addition, there's a heat map calendar that shows the date range of the project and how many items were processed on each day. Uh, this is convenient for um, making sure our numbers are matching up properly. And also we can get an idea of um, just how long and how busy everybody is on a particular day. And also, um, the, um, let's see, the uh, final tracking is a breakdown of hours based on each staff member uh, that's been involved in the project. And it also shows us uh, how many items have been processed. And from there, uh, we can incorporate uh, all this information into our billing records. Uh, the new billing data is combined and put into our billing tracking for um, the SCF website. Um, and this information is very tiny on the screen, but if you look off to the right, uh, you'll see it says deaccessions. And uh, this total is now incorporated into our automatic billing system that we have that we process monthly. And if you um, were to look even closer, it would be down at the bottom of the totals. So with all these pieces in place, it's time to begin um, looking a little bit closer at our very first major project. Uh, George Mason had a project for deaccessing over 5,400 items, and this required close to 80 hours of staff time, um, but it was completed with an efficiency ratio of 6 to 1, which is, as you can see, it says this is high performance. And we finished it in a very small amount of time, and overall I think we can say that it was a resounding success. And with that, um, we're looking forward to 
more future projects like this so that we can reclaim additional storage space in the SCF and to also explore even better ways of streamlining the process. So, who's ready to start deaccessing materials? Thanks to Tammy and Joel and others, we're now ready to offer deaccessions as a service. Uh, but there's a few things to remember. Like any large project, talk to Tammy Hennig first. Tammy will need to coordinate shipping, timing, available space in the processing area, and other factors. Um, remember that deaccessions must be one in and one out. So if you'd uh, like to deaccess 1,000 items, you need to coordinate that project with accessions at the same time. This also means that you'll need to account for the per item accession charge to replace the deaccessed materials. Um, we'll also need 10 to 15 percent more items for deaccession. The chances that you'll send us 1,000 items that are exactly the same distribution of sizes of the items you want to take out of the SCF are slim to none. So to be on the safe side, send us 10 to 15 percent more than what you'd like to get rid of. Any overage that we have will go into your institution's open space. Um, and a last note, as we do more of these projects, we may get better and faster. But at this point, we just don't have enough data. Um, we may find efficiencies down the road that can bring costs down. But for right, right now, we want to be careful and we want to keep learning and doing different kinds of projects. Thanks so much for your time today and for listening. And we're happy to take any questions you might have.